So, um, get that up here, sorry. So I made that as a kind of a picture of a snapshot of, of what's happening right now. Uh, but in order to understand um, what's going on in Afghanistan today, I think we should go back a bit further. Uh, and Afghanistan is Central Asia, and uh, it's, it's at the edge of these Central Asian republics, Tajikistan, um, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, and then Afghanistan has um, had a relationship to these Central Asian republics, uh, and, and of course a key relationship with Iran. Uh, historically, Afghanistan had been part of uh, the Persian Empire for a lot of its history. And then it's connected in the other direction to South Asia, so to what's now Pakistan, to India. So it's this bridge between these these different worlds between Central Asia, which is in turn connected to Europe through Russia, uh, and then South Asia. And those kind of geopolitics have shaped Afghanistan for at least hundreds of years. So in the 19th century, Afghanistan was the site of what was called by the British Empire the Great Game. Right? So the great game was uh, actually between the British Empire and primarily the, the Russian Tsar, you know, the Russian Empire. Uh, and the game was over control of that part of the world where Europe and Asia met. And the British base for that game was South Asia, was, was British India, which included Pakistan. And they established a border between uh, British India and Afghanistan, which was, uh, which was never under their direct control. It was not part of British India. It was not part of the British Empire because they found uh, that it was very difficult to conquer and it was very difficult to control, but it was not so hard to uh, control through subsidies to key allies. So their, 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 great, their um, actions in the great game was to sponsor pick winners in Afghan factional, monarchical kind of politics. And the Soviet, I mean not the Soviets, <laughs> I'm getting ahead of myself, the Russians uh, were trying to do the same uh, and, uh, and the Russians were of course perpetually concerned about their eastern and southern borders. So they were concerned about these Central Asian, uh, well, they eventually became republics, but uh, the, you know, the, the, the British, especially the presence of the British Empire on their border. And uh, this great game is not actually a terrible uh, metaphor for understanding what happened much later. Uh, and one of my favorite writers, Akbal Ahmed, was a, he's a Pakistani, he died in 1999, but he's a, one of the best analysts, uh, I think, you know, a highly underrated analyst. I mention him as often as I can. And he wrote about Afghanistan in the 1980s when, and the late 80s, early 90s, and I'll talk about this period more, but when he talked about it then, and he wrote a long essay called Bloody Games, and he was talking about how Afghanistan in the 90s was not that different in terms of being used in these geopolitical games by bigger players. Um, Afghanistan's a small country. It's 20, between 20 and 30 million people. Well, Canada's between 20 and 30 million people. But it's a very small economy. It's, it's landlocked. It's, uh, it's not got a lot of influence in the world. But it is, because of its geographical location, important to its neighbors. Um, 
in the in the twentieth century, uh, after the USSR came into existence, after they, these revolutions uh, created the Soviet Union as well as the Central Asian republics, um, there was uh, the, the Central Asian republics became an influence on the Afghan monarchy. So the Afghan monarchy looked to those Central Asian republics and said, this is, these are progressive uh, industrializing uh, nations that are becoming powerful and Afghanistan should try to follow this model. So in the, in the 20s, uh, in the 30s, there were attempts to reform the monarchy uh, while they had a border with an out and out British colony, which was India still. I mean, British, British India was still not independent and Afghanistan was in a way ahead of, ahead of India at that time. It was, it was looking to the Central Asian Republics. It was trying to develop industrial policies. It was saying, let's, edu let's try to educate our population. And um, that was a, there was a failed, <laughs> it was actually a failed attempt at reform. And there are some, including in our book, Empire's Ally, one of my colleagues, uh, James Warnock, uh, analyzes Afghanistan's history as a series of failed attempts at reform. And the important reason to remember that is to remember that even if they were failures, Afghanistan's history is full of attempts at reform and progress, uh, at, you know, people trying to develop forward-thinking policies around, you know, social policies about women and education. So I just, I, I wanted to bring this to you, and I, I try to mention this as often as possible because I don't want people to get the idea that Afghanistan is this perpetually backward place where nobody, you know, where there are these barbaric things going on that, that nobody can ever understand or deal with. In fact, you know, I wanted to show that there are Afghan politicians that are against corruption, that are working for uh, change, that have a voice, um, and, and show a different side of, of Afghanistan. In, and, and there is that side, and that's, that exists today, but it was actually even stronger in Afghanistan's history. Um, in, the, in the 1960s, in Afghanistan, there was a, a kind of a, an opening. I mean, again, India had become independent, Pakistan was now independent, um, things were happening uh, in, in Iran, actually. Uh, again, the, the Central Asian republics continued to be uh, somewhat of an inspiration. There was the Soviet bloc, so the hi history was very different than it looks in 2013. There was at the time, a division of the world into socialist and cap, you know, capitalist, or you know, first world, second world, and third world, and Afghanistan was in that world. Afghanistan was facing a, a fairly stark choice. On, on one side, they had Pakistan, which was part of the United States alliance. Um, just past Pakistan was India, which was trying to create this third way, right? The third world project, which included India, Yugoslavia, um, Egypt at the time. So that was another block, the third world, which was in a way a, a, probably, a, you could argue, a failed project as well. Um, and then the second world on their, on their other border with, with the Soviet Union, which was this socialist <coughs> block. So in the 1960s, if you looked at university campuses in Latin America, if you looked at university campuses in Europe, if you looked at university campuses in South Asia or here, you would find people who were socialists, who were communists, who were democratic socialists, who were Trotskyists, uh, you know, a, a lot of different political strains. And in Afghanistan, these became quite powerful political organizations. So there was a communist organization, which had two factions, and there were Islamists. And those were two different strains in the 1960s. And there was a fateful decision that was made by the monarchy to not allow political parties 
And that was a, that was a very fateful decision, I think. Uh, if they had allowed formal political parties uh, in the 1960s, it's quite possible that Afghanistan's history might have been quite different. But political parties were banned, which drove all of these organizations underground. So the communists went underground, the Islamists went underground, and the path to power in Afghanistan in the 60s was, then became no longer, no, it was no longer a path to power to go through elections. So both factions, the communists and the Islamists, began to figure out how to take power through a coup or through a military struggle. And so in the, in the 60s into the 70s, there were these attempts at coups. There were, there were um, attempts by the monarchy to open up. There were people, communist people, uh, you know, communist political figures were reaching out to the Soviet Union. Islamists were actually reaching out to the United States. I know this sounds strange to, to people looking at it from 2013, but the source of, of support from the 1960s on for Islamic politics in Afghanistan was, you know, Pakistan, the Saudi Kingdom, and ultimately the United States, the Central Asian Treaty Organization. Um, the, there was an alliance between the Shah's Iran and Pakistan. Uh, and so Afghanistan was, um, again, torn between these two tendencies. And in the end, or in, in the event, in the late 70s, uh, within Afghanistan, the communists proved politically stronger. They had more support in the army. Um, and so they ended up taking power. So in the late 70s, there was a, a coup, a military-led government that was communist-influenced. Um, and then history gets really kind of complicated uh, because there was a coup and a counter coup and different factions of the Communist Party uh, started to kill each other. And then one of those groups invited the, the Soviet Union to intervene. And the Soviet Union entered Afghanistan. And, and this is where we start getting into a history that's quite disputed. Um, because what we've heard of this history since the, the Soviet invasion of 1979, what we've heard here, what the Afghans have been hearing uh, in Afghanistan, is all um, filtered through a history uh, in which the Soviet Union lost the war, collapsed as a power. And so if you remember the uh, the slogan, history is written by the victors. Well, the victors in this case were the Islamist political factions in Afghanistan. The winners were the Soviet, I mean, the, win the losers were the Soviet Union. And the winners, the sponsors of the winners, were the United States. And so uh, a history has been written of the Soviet invasion communist politics in Afghanistan as if this was a complete aberration, as if this was a, a, the worst period in Afghanistan's history. And in fact, it's really hard to tell what is what the facts are compared to what old propaganda was, whose interests these stories are in. And ultimately, it seems to me, that the way that this history is told today benefits the uh, people that are in power in Afghanistan now uh, and benefits their sponsors, namely the United States. And there are parts of this history that are missing. And the particular parts that I think are the most interesting are the ones about attempts at reform and what happened to them. So when 
when I looked into it and when, when I was asking people about this in Afghanistan, one of the big reasons why, so, you know, we've heard that the Soviet Union invaded and then the um, Mujahideen, the, the Islamist groups, kind of organized a resistance against the Soviet invasion. Um, the Soviets left in 1989 and the communist government, or the, you know, the government that they were sponsoring, held on for three more years, from 1989 to 1992. Uh, that itself is a bit of a question. Why, did they, why were they able to hold on for so long if they were so awful and had no support? In fact, they had quite a bit of support. And if you look at the, the, the facts on the ground, or if you read accounts from at the time, even read Western media at the time, like the New York Times archives or what, whatnot, you'll see that the, that the government actually um, did have su significant support, especially in the cities. And while we, um, you know, we, I'm, a, I'm against uh, the invasion of countries. I'm, in, I'm against violations of sovereignty, uh, regardless of who's doing it. But the, the government that, was, uh, that, that the Soviets were propping up was actually in favor of educating women and was in favor of various progressive measures. So there's, there's these ironies of history. There's a scholar in Canada who's named Nikolai Lanin, who's, he was a soldier in Russia uh, during the Russian occupation of Afghanistan. And he, he went back and he was reading accounts of the NATO, of the US occupation of Afghanistan, and comparing them to the accounts he was reading about the Russian occupation of Afghanistan 30 years before. And a lot of the rhetoric was the same. It was a lot of rhetoric about how we're about to win victory, we're fighting against the enemies of progress, we're fighting against people who uh, are trying to drive the country back, just, you know, harm rights for women. Um, a lot of the, uh, some of this rhetoric in both cases was true. I mean, it's actually true that the Taliban are a misogynist uh, armed group. Um, and it was true when the Soviets were fighting the Mujahideen that the Mujahideen factions were fundamentally misogynist in their politics. And so where do we find people who are not misogynist? Where do we find allies or people that we can you know, support in, in Afghanistan? In 1992, when that government fell, it was the, the leader of that government was a, a guy named Najibullah. And when his government fell, it fell to what would have been in, called in the 60s the Islamists, what was called in 1992 the Mujahideen. And the Mujahideen uh, took over. And that period from 1992 to 2001, really, is what people told us the worst period of Afghanistan's history. So they don't even count, they don't even say that, I mean, the past 13 years have been bad, mainly because they haven't gotten any better. Most of the worst destruction of Afghanistan's infrastructure, and honestly of Afghanistan's memory and, and institutions, happened after 1992, which is interesting. Because when we look back, we think, we see this situation which we're told is, has been barbaric and backwards since time immemorial. In fact, a lot of it was consciously destroyed and not very long ago. And a lot of that memory has been destroyed and a lot of that history has been destroyed and not very long ago. So um, from 1992 until 1996, the Mujahideen were in power. And they got to Kabul, they, they overthrew that, that government that had been supported by the Soviets. Uh, they 
they got into power and they immediately started fighting among themselves. So some of the names you might have heard, Gulbuddin Hikmatyar, who was an Islamist in the 60s at the university, one of these core uh, political, hardcore Islamist um, you know, people in Kabul, was one of the key figures in the Mujahideen in 1992. And he wanted to be the leader of the government. And Rabbani and Masood were in Kabul and in control, and they took power for themselves. And that dispute between Hikmatyar and Masood and Rabbani, they involved shelling large parts of Kabul. So when we were traveling in Kabul, we saw parts of Kabul that had been destroyed between 1992 and 1996 and never rebuilt. And each of these, so Hikmatyar had a, a faction and a significant armed force of his own. Masood and Rabbani did. There were other warlords as well. Um, Ismail Khan uh, in the north um, and a few other warlords. Um, all of whom have, you know, interesting and, and individual histories of developing armed force and business interests uh, in their own right. And they became, and they did all this over the course of the war with the Soviets. And when that war ended, they began to fight for control, for territorial control. And so this is what we call the warlords. This is what... Um, people that we like, like the Revolutionary uh, Afghan Women's Association, but like other, other organizations that we might, you know, listen to, be interested in their analysis. They ref people like Malalai Joya, uh, they might refer to uh, these factions as warlords. So Malalai Joya has a book called A Woman Among Warlords. But there's also academic analysis. There's a guy named Antonio Giustuzzi who has a great book called Empires of Mud where he describes some of these warlords. Um, so these warlords became the power after 1992. And, and they, were, they had business interests, armed force that they organized themselves. And importantly, a lot of them had relationships with foreign powers. So... Some of them are sponsored by Iran. Hikmatyar has a good relationship with Pakistan, and so on. And in, that, in all of this kind of chaotic warlord battles of the early 90s, Pakistan saw an opportunity to um, exert greater control over Afghanistan's future. And Pakistan wants to do this because of a notion that they call strategic depth. So if you look at Pakistan, it's a long, narrow country. They're always concerned about an Indian invasion. And so some generals from Pakistan looked at a map and they came up with this concept called strategic depth. If we have a friendly Afghanistan, we can retreat backward into Afghanistan and, and defend ourselves against India. So for the, in the name of strategic depth, a lot of terrible things have been done to Afghanistan over the past few decades. Um, the Pakistan, the, the, Actually, the no, Taliban, better one would probably be the who Oops. currently the Sorry, West is if fighting, I can't find it quickly, was I will. more or less created and sponsored and developed by Pakistan. Yeah, that's and not And they bad. sponsored them and help them get to get back into Afghanistan. Their constituency is mostly refugees, people who were displaced by the war and grew up in those refugee camps in Pakistan during the Afghan Civil War. And then they went back and they took most of the south of Afghanistan. And the north, they never managed to take because the, the northern, a, a group of these warlords got together. They called themselves the Northern Alliance, but the Northern Alliance was Ismail Khan, Ahmed Shah Massoud, and a few other warlords, and they managed to hold the line. So de facto, nine, from 1996 on, there was a division in Afghanistan between the South and the North. And the North is controlled by these warlords, and the South is controlled by the Taliban. And that is actually still the case today.
So from 2001 to 2013, the, Na the NATO invasion, the U.S. occupation, um, if, you look, uh, if you look at where incidents are, if you look at where the war is, is at its hottest, and maybe I can just briefly show you a map from my blog, if I can bring it up very quickly. So what I did there was I looked at the WikiLeaks uh, Afghan war diary, and I just mapped um, incidents. And if you look at where, that, that, it's a good map. The red shows you where the war is happening, right? It's kind of the southeast. It, those are the Taliban-controlled areas. And so if you talk to people from Afghanistan, if they're from the north, they don't really experience the war like people from the south. When we went to Kabul, Kabul's kind of central Afghanistan, there was no question about going to the south. I, I asked around and said, yeah, you know, what do you think about going to Kandahar? And people were like, you're, you're not going to Kandahar. Nobody goes to Kandahar. So, I mean, it, it might change. It, you know, some places are starting to become accessible, but, but um, this kind of de facto partition of the country is one of the, one of the little secrets of, uh, of Afghanistan that, that is not as widely understood as it should be. And uh, so what, as we look forward to the future of Afghanistan, it's a, this, this question of like, are the Taliban going to take over? And I think the answer to that question is that it's um, to the, they, they exert a, a, quite a lot of control in the south, but for them to be able to take the north or to take Kabul, I think is going to be very, very difficult. But similarly, if there's a government in Kabul that wants to exert control over the south of Afghanistan against Pakistan's wishes, and go and root out the Taliban, I also don't think that that's very likely. So in a way, what the NATO occupation of Afghanistan has done is not very much. It's, it's frozen the situation that existed from 1996 to 2001. Uh, so all of these hundreds of billions of dollars, all of this you know, all of this blood and treasure that's gone into this occupation uh, and, and, and the political situation has actually not really been affected. Um, there have been changes. Uh, and in fact, I, I should say this. Uh, I talked to electoral officials, people who were involved in trying to make sure that the 2014 election is going to be clean because there's been a lot of corruption. The, pre, the last election was pretty dubious in a lot of ways. And they, I, I said, you know, what do you think I should tell people when I get to Canada? And one, one of these guys, he said, look, you know, not everything NATO has done here has been good. You know, they've killed a lot of civilians. They've done a lot of bad things. But on balance, you know, we need Western help. Like, we can't afford for the West to just leave right now. And so for me, the way I interpret that is the question is not, you know, should we just abandon Afghanistan or should we just leave Afghanistan? The question is, how can we help? How can, how can Canada or the West help in a way that actually helps, in a way that actually bolsters the country's sovereignty, that actually, you know, supports attempts at reform the, the way that, as they have done, uh, as Afghanistan has tried to do reform throughout its history, as opposed to the kind of help that has been arriving over the past few decades, which has been to destroy those things. Um, you know, when you look at the history of Afghanistan, the, there, there's, there's a lot of, there's been a lot of interesting reports by there's a group called the Afghan Analyst Network, and they're trying to interview 
people who were involved in some of these campus movements and, and campus politics and the communist party, uh, the communists and the Maoists and the Parcham and the Kalk factions of the communist uh, party in Afghanistan before they all passed, right? A lot of them have been killed uh, in the war and a lot of them are getting up there in years and uh, life expectancy in Afghanistan is not high. And, uh, and a lot of this, a lot of this history is is being lost with each person that passes we lose a piece of this of this past and and if we don't recognize that there are people in Afghanistan and they're trying to do things and some of the things they're trying to do we've you know the west has been suppressing and destroying the the counter in, as far as i can tell the counterinsurgency against reform, like against women going to school and against girls' education and against some of these progressive elements in, the, in, the, in politics in the 60s, that started before the Soviet invasion. So even that relationship that the Mujahideen were fighting against an invasion of their sovereignty, that's not entirely true. And the West was sponsoring the Mujahideen before uh, the Soviets even invaded. So that's not help, right? That hasn't been help. And the past 10 or 13 years, the kind of things that the West has done in Afghanistan have been for its own reasons. Canada has been in Afghanistan to show the United States that they're helping. Canada has not been in Afghanistan to help Afghans. The United States has been in Afghanistan in order to exert control over the region, not to help Afghans. So these, yeah, so I guess my, the last, I would conclude my talk here with an appeal to try to see and understand Afghanistan a little bit differently than it's presented. Try to understand it as a place where Afghans exist, have ideas, have politics, have tried to make change, and, and where the West has not been failing at trying to help these people, but hurting these people. Um, and if we can figure out ways to stop doing that and change that relationship, it can only be good for Afghanistan. That's all. Thanks. We can uh, do some questions. We can turn that. Yeah, one sec.